very last of talk of today, maybe this week even. And uh, my name is Dong Chen from Google. Together with me, we have uh, Matt from Amo and Peter from the Red Hat and also Dixie from Google. We are going to introduce Signal and what we have done and our work to you. Um, yeah, next. So you can see that this is the picture of four of us the first day, just right in front of this conference room, the first day at the Kubica. And you can see that we are exciting and we got tired, but we are exhausted because some of us have the jet lag. And you also can see us today, we're ex exhausted and uh, but uh, satisfied here and on the stage, yeah. So here it, uh, okay, before this trip, might here and kind of suggest us or maybe force us to uh, reflect our lives uh, 360 degrees and so then we can know each other better because we've been work so long uh, virtually because due to all kind of rhythm pandemic all those kind of things but we don't know each other we only know our work uh, part of this this is what we are put here together and I share with everyone here and uh, here is the today's agenda, and uh, my job is very simple: just introduce, signal, and and what we are doing, and straightforward. And uh, then Peter is going to talk about our achievement proudly, and uh, then Dixie is going to talk about what it is the selected project, uh, what we are currently looking at, and uh, what we put our time and energy. On. And Matt is going to talk about about the future direction. A lot of things may be familiar. If you went to a lot of talk we've been talking about uh, before this co uh, the conference uh, and a lot of work like the DI is being discussed uh, um, more than actually it's more than a couple years and finally we reached a certain stage and uh, so we want to share with you and uh, so okay let's go I think everyone here in this room definitely familiar with this graph and here is the API server and at the CD and the control plan and the scheduler all work together form of the control plan for a given cluster which is managing many many uh, nodes and uh, so if you are here it means uh, we haven't done good job because you are so care about it. the my goal it is always as the infrastructure folks my goal always is to make uh, we are invisible you equal us so obviously you are here you want to know more and when it is we are not uh, uh, bring the reliability to you or maybe it is we haven't done enough to support your new needs so let's figure out today um, so let's explore quickly explore like the critical components on the node and uh, all those all those critical components form of the backbone of our cluster and uh, make sure uh, we can run off the containerized application um, so the first one is the kubernetes obviously the format on the node and which acting of the uh, agent container uh, control plan of the agent and ensure of we can run our uh, manage of the pod life cycle management and uh, also collaborate with of the container runtime and uh, to uh, ensure of the container creation, deletion, and also run within its allocated of the resource. Container of the runtime, the popular uh, choice, it is the Docker, Container D, and uh, Cryo. They are ensure the management of the container lifecycle, creation, deletion, all those kind of things. And also they are pull of the image and pack of the image layers and ensure we can run all those kind of things. I, this time is first time I separate off the resource management because there are so many things discussing going on. So, and uh, to, at least today is the Kubernetes uh, together along with of the container uh, runtime. We are ensure uh, the, uh, the acting as the resource governance for all those running container and the parts and ensure they are running uh, also ensure of the allocate of those CPU memory and other resources for those running applications effective of the resource management can ensure of the performance and also avoid of unnecessary the resource contention on the node so you must have heard a lot of the device plugin management and also ongoing of the dynamic resource allocator effort and they all 
is to try to discovery of the specialness of the hardware on the node and uh, share the availability of those kind of things to the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes uh, together with control plane and uh, can allocate off the part which needs those devices and uh, being a, uh, a scheduled and can you access those devices and use those kind of things. So there's a lot of discussing. I think uh, uh, Matt, Matt, both Matt and, uh, and, uh, and Peter is going to touch base later and give an overall and a cap, recap about those kind of things being discussed this week and also last many months. So next one, it is no the problem detector. No the problem detector is just like a watchdog, just like any watchdog running on the node and uh, will be actively monitor about uh, the issues on the node. It could be monitor some hardware failure and the kernel deadlock and also even like the unresponsible Kubernetes and even container runtime. Um, so uh, node problem detector also report those problem to the control plan and so control plan can take corrective reaction. For example, reschedule parts and the count of the nodes and all those kind of things. I think last many years we didn't invest heavily on the node problem detector and we should put more effort on those kind of things. The very last, but it's not really um, last one, it is the storage and the network component. For example, CSI and the CNI, basically it is just make sure of the smooth of the communication uh, and also make sure of we, we can integrate with the storage resource, all those kind of things. So who is, uh, which team and who is the people and the management of those components and to make sure they work together uh, same next day and actually it's the signal, a virtual and a critical team in the Kubernetes community and uh, response ensure we are can smooth power execution on those work machines. And uh, we often heard a lot of complaint from the open community and um, uh, Everything's contribute to signal is really slow and not much progress, which is so true. And we apologize for that one, but I also want to point out uh, we have active member involved with signal activities, right? If you can see that, I just list before this meet conference, I just uh, a week ago, at least I, I find all those kind of information. You can see how many people and uh, involved and uh, uh, actively and inactively, <laughs> and uh, into, and also you can see that how many projects, sub projects we've been uh, running uh, concurrently, and the work group we've been participate. And uh, another thing it is, I just go back to the previous release, like last year, since last year, and uh, we. Uh, like type, like features we've been working on, you can see that. And uh, if you really compare to Signal and other nodes, we always actually is the most one that have to deliver most of the cap and uh, track of the most of the cap and ensure we can we can deliver. So also we have several effort to like the uh, separate effort. Of in addition of the weekly signal meeting, we have the weekly charge meeting, and you can see that uh, this is uh, the Last night, I asked our SIG project leads and gave them the data from the Sergey, also our SIG chair, and he gave me like every day, like every week, average back charge. It is the uh, twelve. We have the new goal, and the Dixie is the new need here, and we have uh, worked together. We can like the want to have the new target is like the twenty ish or maybe beyond this year, and then we also have the like long average of the PR open and the review weekly. It is uh, a little bit more than twenty, and uh, then so those are those the facts I just got from the need. Okay. Now I hand over to Peter to talk about what we've been achieved, real work. Hey everyone, thank you for joining uh, and sticking around, uh, you know, to the end of KubeCon. Um, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm also working on Signode, and I'm here to talk about some of the stuff that we're currently working on and thinking about. Um, and uh, we'll start with off with Cap. So I basically. Uh, here are a list of all of the caps that we worked on in uh, one dot, or all the ones that merged. Actually, we worked on more, but you know how caps go. Um, so we have uh, these twelve caps, which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about. But I'd like to first sort of highlight a little statistic, which I'm quite proud of, and I think all of us up here should be, and anyone who works on Sigdode, which is that, um, and it's a little bit of bragging, but. Uh, uh, 
Signode is has the most caps that have uh, merged, uh, and we have made progress on in 130. So that's pretty Woo! cool. Um, so you know, as Don alluded to, you know, some people say that Sig Node is a very slow uh, Sig, but it's actually also a very large Sig, and as a result, we're actually very productive. We're just, you know, we have a lot to do, um, and we're always looking for more help, which uh, Mateus will talk about a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more just about the caps that we've been working on um, and go into it a little bit more detail. Um, I've bucketed them into a couple of different uh, groups. Um, the first one, which I'm also quite proud about, is uh, we've made a lot of progress in 130 on some very old caps. You see this number 24. App Armor Support is actually the oldest currently open cap. Uh, and it has languished a little bit in beta, and it's still in beta. We haven't graduated yet, but we have made some progress in 1.30 um, by making uh, the uh, App Armor Fields uh, feature gate, which has you specify with a former uh, formal API similar to SecComp profiles, um, so you don't need to use annotations anymore, um, which is quite good. And we're hoping to have that go to stable uh, in the future. We also made some progress on user namespaces. It graduated to beta in this release, which we're very excited about. Um, and we uh, updated it so that now it requires the CRI to have support for user namespace ID map mounting um, before, and the underlying container runtime as well, before it specifies, which closes a potential security hole where the Cuba thinks that there's ID map mount support, but actually there is not. Um, so this is good, and we're looking forward to uh, expanding the use cases for user namespaces and um, the perv uh, pervasiveness of them. Um, another one we made some progress on is uh, memory swap. Um, and that we have retargeted to beta 2 again. We've added an additional option now, the no swap option, which means you can have swap enabled on the node, but none of the containers are actually given any swap, which is useful for cases if you have like some other you know, entity that's giving a uh, container swap, like you know, with an NRI plugin or something like that. But they're not coordinated with the kubelet, which uh, means there's a little bit more um, customizability with the swap, but it's still like the cube is not going to fail if swap is enabled. Um, and we also dropped support for unlimited swap because it introduced a whole bunch of issues and node instability and we didn't like it, so we took it out. So sorry if you like that, but um, it's not very good. Um, and then uh, we also made some progress on proc mount type, which was first introduced in 112 as alpha and has not made any progress since. It's still in alpha, um, but we're now relying on user namespaces to actually specify it because all of the use cases we think of, which is often containers in Inside of a pod, uh, like you know, a nested container um, inside of a container that's in a pod, um, uh, are really relevant with user namespaces as well. And introducing proc mount type without user namespaces is almost as strong as like introducing an another like semi privileged option. So we have that um, dependency now as well. The next bucket of features, which I'm not going to go into as much depth, but these are all just some features that were formerly in uh, alpha, and now they're in beta. They're following the normal life cycle of um, KEPs, and uh, we're excited about them. Uh, Drop-in Cuba configuration will allow you to specify, you know, drop-in config um, for the kubelet, which um, can allow you to customize the configuration easier. Um, image GC after maximum age allows you to clean up a uh, image or specify an image should be cleaned up after a certain time period, and then uh, a sandbox creation condition, which is useful for batch workloads, and then a sleep action for post stop hook, allowing you to you know pause after post stop. Um, these up here, which uh, are brand new features in alpha, um, and you know we're also feeling excited about them. Um, and I'm going a little over time, so I'm actually gonna you know just glance over them, but you can look, they're in progress and we're looking forward to be making uh, more progress on them as well. Um, the final bucket, which is actually just one cap, but it's very relevant now and everyone's thinking a lot about it. Um, and it's, you know, we're celebrating uh, this week, it's a uh, DRA con. Um, you know, these are all the talks that were about DRA, but actually in reality, the reason that it's so relevant is it's actually AI con. Um, and here are all of the talks that are about AI and machine learning. Um, so obviously the Kubernetes community is thinking a lot, or in cloud native generally is thinking a lot about being relevant in um, AI workloads and being able to handle those types and um, DRA is one of the things that SigNode is thinking a lot about in enabling uh, those uh, special workloads. So um, 
you know, I'm going to go just briefly over because, you know, there are all those other talks that you can go and reference. But um, DRA is basically a way to teach the scheduler and the Cube API about special devices. Um, and it is relevant for enabling GPU and special networking cards. In the context of AI, we're really thinking about GPU enablement, but it also can enable special uh, and all of that. Um, and it defines what we call topology, which, you know, is just a fancy way of saying, the, like, the node resource alignment. So you have resources that are on a node and you want to be able to align the pods with those resources. So the DRA, as it currently works now, it's, this is a brief diagram, and it's currently an alpha, well, it was an alpha pre-130, and it's still, in, we've changed it a little bit, and I'll get into that, but the pre-130, this is the way that it worked, where basically a vendor is able to register, you know, a special API to the, with the DRA driver controller, and that sets um, some information to the scheduler about, you know, what resources are available on a node. But there are a couple of problems with it and things that we're looking to fix. Um, so uh, one of those things is you want to be able to, like there exists this use case where there are multiple uh, GPU uh, plugged into a node and you want to be able to choose which GPU a pod is, uh, you know, you want to be aligned to. And the current API wasn't really able to do that ex expressively. Um, there also is the delayed allocation problem, which is uh, currently the way the scheduling works is the scheduler has some information about what is on the node, but really it's just going to go and, you know, try sequentially through all the nodes and be like, can I try this? here and then it gets denied at runtime rather than at scheduling which is kind of inefficient um, and a consequence of that um, you know pattern is also right now there's no way to signal to cluster auto scalers when you know because we're not thinking about it at the scheduling level it's being denied at the runtime so there's no way to tell an auto scaler like hey we don't actually have enough of these GPUs or these uh, special networking cards so like we need to make more nodes so the way that um, has been proposed to fix this is uh, uh, so th this is the proposal, um, you know, sort of new uh, setup, which is going to um, allow the kubelet to, well, it, the DRA driver has kind of two pieces of it. One of it is, you know, to specify the resources and that goes to the schedule and also have the kubelet be able to broadcast that information to the scheduler. So it, the scheduler has more in-depth knowledge about what uh, these resources are and what they have. Um, and that means that it can deny things at scheduling step and that will allow, um, you know, other events to be listening to the way that the scheduler works and be able to react to that. So this has been done with uh, CAP 4381 structured parameters, and we're all thinking a lot about this. And, you know, this is going to probably be the hottest topic of the next year. So stay tuned and, um, you know, let us know if you have any other use cases for it. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, obviously uh, looking forward to seeing you at AICON in um uh, Salt Lake City. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass to Dixie, who's going to talk about another deep dive in Signode. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dixita. I go by the alias Dixie. And I'm going to deep dive into in-place pod resize. And why in-place pod resize in particular? Because I hope it also becomes a resource management con next time. So... <laughs> <laughs> This is um, one of the features that can actually impact the cost of the resources being used and has the prospect of reducing the cost of uh, running your workloads. So what is in-place pod resize? So today, if your uh, workloads um, require more resources or if they require fewer, number, uh, fewer, res fewer amount of resources while they are running, and if you were to resize those, uh, Today, those pods need to be recreated. But with in-place pod resize, uh, you should be able to uh, resize your pods on the fly dynamically without, your, uh, without any disruption to the pods. Uh, why in-place pod resize can be helpful? When you have workloads that are kind of bursty or that kind of utilize more number of resources in the beginning or any, uh, and for a specified amount of time while they are running, uh, In-place pod resize can be helpful uh, by resizing your resources um, depending on the pod's usage. Um, and like I said previously, it can also help with the cost reduction, and it can also help when the resources are not specified um, properly in the pod spec. So what are the changes uh, that we made in the, pods, in the container spec uh, for this feature? So if you see here, we have added a new uh, field called resize policy where you can specify uh, whether you want to restart your container or not uh, for scaling uh, CPU or memory depending upon your uh, needs. 
as for this feature uh, the resources were made mutable which helps you to change uh, change the values on the fly depending on the usage and this works with the uh, vertical pod auto scaling the another change uh, that this feature required was to change the status uh, the pod spec uh, the pod status and it has been extended to show the amount of resources that are allocated for your pod versus uh, the amount of resources that you desire your pods should have. So the allocated resources is the one that is allocated at a point of time. And when you do the resize, you can see there is another field called resize, which shows you uh, the status of your resize. So as per the spec, the resize is in progress, and the desired state is specified in the resources section for CPU and memory. The status of this feature is this is in alpha right now uh, since 127. And we have been trying to promote it to beta for a while now, and we are seeking for some user feedback. There are a lot of blockers here, which I have specified uh, and added the links in, in interest of time. We won't be deep diving into it. And in 131, we are trying to address at least some of the uh, outstanding issues if we are not able to do beta, but we are actually trying to aim for it. Uh, some of the issues uh, that we have already addressed are uh, supporting CPU managers, static policy, and some more, and the rest are added in the link. And I will hand it over to Matthias. Thank you. Hello. So let's now look at the future of Signode. So if you probably heard it, uh, there was an anniversary. Uh, so Kubernetes turned 10. And last, last year, during the Chicago KubeCon, there was like a great keynote talk from Tim. I gave the link so you can see it uh, later. And in this, um, during this keynote, he asked several uh, Kubernetes engineers, what should be the future for the next decade of, of, uh, of Kubernetes. So one of them was Clayton. And Clayton said that Kubernetes is very good because we can throw any workload at it and it's gonna be average, but it will work. So now, as a signal to support this statement, we take the decision to shift more the signal focus from infrastructure to workload. But it, it already happened. So we already ha currently have uh, a set of, of features or caps that are working on to support this. Uh, we are trying to announce the lifecycle management with the sidecar containers. We, want, we are already working on declarative node maintenance. We focus on addressing some of the hardware uh, better, like NUMA support, GPU, TPU, accelerators, storage also. Um, another very important thing when you are doing, when you are, spe when you are specific on the workload is how do you isolate? So, and of course, we collaborate with other SIGs on this, namely SIG apps, architecture, auto scaling, scheduling, and batch. But as um, Peter said, the elephant is in the room, so all this work is not sufficient because of AI. And especially one, another kind of AI that uh, we are prepared for, which is inference. And if we focus on inference or gen AI, uh, it, it's really different from a normal uh, ML uh, workload where you train your model. Because in this case, you need to serve and, and you need to keep on serving. Where, where for training, you can do batch, you save and it's finished. Usually, you schedule one workload, one, one workload per node and you take all the resource on this one. And by the sheer size of the models, it takes a while to start. So today, uh, there are different vendors that are trying to use the stateful set for that, but they are not suitable. We have scheduling issues. We need a better way of allocating resources. So auto-scaling also needs improvements. And 
actually, uh, this was like pointed out uh, for the DRA that we needed, and also for some uh, future work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, SIGNode and other SIGNode uh, and other SIGs, we are proposing to create a new work group specifically for inference or serving. We haven't decided the name yet together with SIGAPS, Architecture, Autoscaling, and Workgroup Batch. It has been discussed last Monday during the, the Contributor Summit. And we plan on evolving the DRA, improve the, in uh, the, the pod resizing, and also continue with the swap and huge page support. Another uh, plan for the future is to don't improve the, the stateful set for HPC workloads. So, which translate into revisiting the, the, the hardware model for the, for the node. So there was like a non-conference also on Monday, and here are some of the key points to, to remember from this conference. We want to make like efficient use of the, of the hardware. We want to be workload agnostic, we want better scheduling, predictive scaling, and as I said in the beginning, focus on the workload. So this conference was just the beginning. We haven't started working on it yet, but at least all the right person went, were on the same place and we started the discussions. So we should really s stay tuned, as we said, and uh, w watch for the improvements in the future. Also, we cannot do this alone. So Signode is a big SIG, but we have a lot of work to do, so we need your help. So in this room, if you think about contributing, there are ways of contributing. You don't need to be like a, a super talented uh, coder. We have code contributions. I listed them here by priority about what we need. You can inc increase the test coverage, please fix bugs uh, or do code reviews, but you can also contribute even if you don't code. Just try your features, improve the documentation, or give feedback on the, on the user experience, or translate the docs, or organize some events to spread the word and make sure everybody knows about how Kubernetes is great. Now I'm gonna try to convince you why you should invest particularly in Signode, because we're a great team. That's it. We enjoy food, we enjoy drinks, and uh, now to be more like, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so as, as, as Dawn said in the, in the beginning, uh, we are at the center of, of everything, so we are contributing to core components of, uh, of Kubernetes, we, we have like, uh, we are ranging from problems in, in hardware, in network, in, in discussion with the CRI, uh, in scheduling, in the pod life cycle. Uh, so there is definitely something for you to, to, to work on. And of course, as other SIGs and, and the whole Kubernetes community, we are welcoming anyone to help and uh, yeah, I mean, you should really try, reach, to, reach, reach out to us, um, try to join the meetings. I think I have, yeah, here, how do you do? So we, there is like a, a website helping you how to get started into the Kubernetes contributions. Um, I gave the links for the community meetings that Dawn uh, mentioned. Uh, we have the main page for the Signode. All the working groups, there will be new ones, and some links about how to mentor. So please consider that. And if you want to have the, the slides of this, I will upload them into the SCED, and there is a QR code to, to reach it. Now, I think we can go to questions.
the uh, <clears throat> KEP in one uh, in one dot twenty nine. It was um, talking about the the cubelet GC. Is that gonna? Is that just? Is that for all images, or is that just for the uh, cubelet image? Um, so that is for the container images. So like so all all container images. We'll right. Be able to right. Just specify, hey, you're too old. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. So it's you specify like a timeout, and after an image is unused for a certain amount of time, then it um, is qualified for garbage collection, regardless of node pressure, like memory uh, disk pressure on the node. Thank you. We've been doing a lot of work, and it's um, and we have a lot of experimental um, uh, progress. I guess we actually chose for various reasons to um, base everything on one dot two a, and um, but w what is the actual process of how can we get feedback on on how to refactor what we've done to be acceptable before we go through? I I don't want to waste our time and your time, um, like creating a cap that is just going to, um, there's unnecessary editing cycles, for mm. example. Uh, uh. We can do a short version where we explain what our objectives are, um, and then we can also list a, all the follow-on objectives that we have, because we've identified a lot of different things that we want to contribute into, particularly um, Kubelet in the runtime. Um, and, and if you have some plans ahead of, you know, we also want to sort of fit in. Um, so even though we've done it one way today, um, I, I don't want to go too far and have to refactor it significantly. Um, thanks for this one, and uh, uh, I have to honestly say, most of the people give us feedback uh, came to the signal, the weekend meeting, but the, when you raise this uh, question, actually, today's meeting, I realize actually the bar for, for, for uh, community to give us the feedback is too high. Uh, so you have to go to the signal meeting and the time difference, all those kind of things. So there's another way to give us the feedback so because we have the signal, the uh, mailing list, and we reach out to most of the engineer. But I also think, I also think about that the bar is too high because the signal, the many people subscribed. So you know, so um, maybe after this this one, I can uh, talk to you. Sure. We should figure out uh, one way to not just hit to everyone and uh, and. There's the some way we can we can accept, right? So accept. So not disclose all your personal information, contact information to entire of the community, but you can provide the feedback to us. Yeah, yeah. And also for earlier like the image garbage collection, there also have the. I just want to add one thing, and there also have the discussing for some image, even like not like the where uh, use, but uh, there's the way for. We, at least we discussed how to pin those images, and even uh, you set off that uh, uh, time uh, expiry date, and it could be there's the discussing, and uh, so just want to add one thing. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is around in-place um, no, uh, pod resize. Uh, it's it's an amazing feature, and this is I'm I'm being uh, I'm very new to Signal uh, as uh, as an consumer of the uh, feature. So uh, my question is, we typically recommend uh, any app platforms when they're deploying, uh, uh, when they're gauging or estimating their resource requirements to have higher density on the nodes. Now, how does in-place in pod resize separate itself or uh, provide additional functionality in terms of when the, when the nodes are highly dense, how can it avoid rescheduling? Uh, how can it separate itself from virtual uh, vertical pod or the scaler? We are essentially in a situation where we'll end up rescheduling that pod on a different node and having something similar to vertical pod or the scaler. And in place, uh, pod resize, does it have any impact on the future for vertical pod or the scaler as well? In place, uh, pod resizing actually is just enhancement for existing VPA. So existing VPA basically just risk you restart those right so you update that one then you restart in places mean like the 
if possible. Of course, not we cannot guarantee, especially for the memory, you shrink memory, and you could cause off the wall, so the container may still die, but uh, that's basically it's just reduce, uh, make sure that if possible, then container still can run, yeah. It's, it's not like the get rid of the VPA. No, it's just enhan enhancement, yeah. So what VPA is part of the uh, SIG auto scaling, and then it's an extended functionality in SIG node. Is that how we're looking at this? Mm. In place pod resize. Uh, yes, like yes, uh, VPA, yes, yes, VPA, because uh, to make this in place pod uh, resizing, we have to work together with the auto scaling, right? So always, uh, otherwise, how you are going to get uh, the monitoring, all those kind of things and make decision. Uh, so and also this, this is a lot of decisions not uh, only done by node, uh, maybe initiated by node and uh, uh, enablement by the node. Uh, but for this particular feature, actually, it's enablement by uh, cross organization, not just node, and also like the auto scanning. And also another thing is that just we maybe we oversimplify here, right? So like the how you are going to in place update. Eventually, you have based on some priority. So we are going to make that yeah. My question is about um, VPA uh, in, inside, uh, in, um, in place uh, resizing as well. Um, so from what I understand, there's no restarting. It, um, but does it, does there, is there going to be any kind of impact to the workload? And how does it work for uh, pods that are running something like a JVM, where increasing the memory for the pod may not necessarily increase it for the JVM? Yep. Then in this case, you you have to have a workload that is able to to use this memory that you have. Yeah. So not not in, in the case of the GVM or if you use GoLang with like uh, GoMem Max GoMem or something. Yeah. It, it it won't help. I mean, there is no magic, but at least that's something that is possible today. And you could still uh, tell the VPA to restart uh, to 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 create a new container. I guess. To, to, to use the new, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.